Good afternoon. Welcome to St. Francis of Assisi American National Catholic Church. Today we celebrate the 25th Sunday in Ordinary Time. We invite you to stand and greet our celebrant, Bishop Lucy, and join together and sing number 671, Glory and Praise to Our God. That's number 671. Glory and praise to our God, who alone gives light to our days. Many other blessings he bears to those who trust in his ways. We are daughters and sons of him who build the valleys and Our God has done in every heart that sings. Glory and praise to our God, who alone gives light to our days. Many are the blessings He bears to those who trust in His way. Peace to God's people. 
and the master commended that dishonest steward for acting prudently. For the children of this world are more prudent in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. I tell you, make friends for yourselves with dishonest wealth, so that when it fails, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. The person who is trustworthy in very small matters is also trustworthy in great ones. And the person who is dishonest in very small matters is also dishonest in great ones. If therefore you are not trustworthy with dishonest wealth, who will trust you with true wealth? If you are not trustworthy with what belongs to another, who will give you what is yours? No servant can serve two masters. You will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and man. Brothers and sisters, the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. These readings, I think, make, uh, they make me a little uncomfortable. I don't know if they make you uncomfortable, maybe for the same reasons. I spent a lot of time uh, with these over the week, and yesterday I had the privilege of uh, saying Mass at St. Clair's, and I thought I would kind of practice my homily there. And instead, I stumbled around a lot, uh, not, uh, not, not, not saying exactly what I think maybe the readings were capturing for us. And so I prayed again this morning with these, and I read them again. But they are very difficult readings, and most of the commentaries that I've looked at really do speak about these readings in their historical context. First of all, Amos uh, is, the, is the prophet par excellence of, uh, of reminding us, of, uh, of calling us back to the covenant. And, you know, uh, you know, my aunts used to say they would go shopping down at the market and they would say, uh, so-and-so put his thumb on the scale. I never knew what that meant, right? But, but they were getting less uh, for what they were paying for, right? And so, so I guess it's been happening forever and in many ways. And so Amos is reminding uh, the people of Israel and you and I of this covenant. Amos is always, he has a series of visions in which the, uh, the people of Israel are represented either uh, by a, a, a plague of locusts destroying them or rotten fruit in a basket. And he's saying to them, it, you really have to remember what is the what are the core elements of this covenant, that you will be my people and I will be your God and I shall write my law on your hearts. And so he's saying, don't just show up kind of uh, uh, for the during the during the Sabbath and do what you're supposed to do. Do that all of the time. Don't wait for the new moon to pass so that you can you can deflate the epoch of wheat, or that you can inflate the shekel. Do be, be honest in all your dealings all of the time. That is always God's call to us, to enter into some uh, movement in our own integrity. That's why you and I here sit at St. Francis American National Catholic Church. Something about our experience of God has drawn us here, has drawn us in a way that reflects some measure of our attempt to live an integrated life and to tell the truth about who we are and about how we find some element of our of the truth of ourselves in our faith. And so, so we hear Amos saying that Timothy, the letter to Timothy is often seen as a way to organize uh, uh, the church as an organization. But what I like in this particular reading and what is something that we always proclaim here is God is God of all peoples, not just some peoples, right? And so, so that everyone is invited and welcome here. It's amazing. On Friday, I had the privilege of celebrating a uh, nuptial mass, and uh, the bride was Catholic, and the groom was uh, non-denominational, but had uh, uh, some, I think his father was Jewish, and so uh, he loved his wife so much that he wanted her to have a nuptial mass. That was kind of such a wonderful, loving gift, right? And he said, the only thing that I would ask is if I can break the glass at the end so we could all say muzzle talk, which we did, which we really did, right? And, uh, and so, so uh, as I do always, everyone is invited to receive uh, the Eucharist because it is Christ's promise to us to not leave us orphans. And I stood in the back uh, of the chapel, and after Mass, people came and they shook my hand. 
and they weren't Catholic, and I don't know if they were Jewish, I don't know if they were Christian, but they couldn't thank me enough. And I thought to myself, that, that you're welcome, but it doesn't come from me. It grows from our experience here together at St. Francis of knowing the truth of that, that God is God for all peoples, all of the time, not just some of the time, right? Not just when we're in church or when we're not in church. God is God of the peoples all of the time. And then this reading, Jesus, by the way, you know this, in Jesus in his human nature, in his historical, he was a rabbi. He was a wise Jew. He knew what he was talking about. He commends this servant. We might say that the gospel upholds the virtue of prudence, right? He commends this servant for being prudent. He commends the servant for knowing how to CYA, I guess, right? So, so he knows he's going to lose his job. And so, so he says, what will I do? How will I ingratiate my, my, myself with these people? And he says, I know what I'll do. Is all the debtors, I'll have them, uh, I'll have them uh, cut their debt in half. And so, so this is somebody whose job was to, uh, to take inventory. And how he got paid was, I guess, taking some off the top. This particular steward took too much off the top. And I guess he got caught, right? And so, so but I love this line. Uh, my father used to say to me, he said, I'll always eat if I, if, I can, if, I, if I remember that I can dig a ditch. And I do remember that, right? I hope to God I don't have to dig a ditch. But, but, uh, but in any case, this steward says, I, 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 I can't dig and I'm too proud to beg. And I thought, that's an interesting notion. So he does something. And his prudence is, is recommended to us in this reading. So he makes sure that he ingratiates himself with the debtors. But aside from that, he makes sure that his master is also ingratiated in the minds of these servants, right? So that if the master tries to punish him in any way, eh, the master will look very foolish. This is a very wise steward. And so, so, so the master uh, commends him for that. And so maybe, maybe for you and I, the, 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 the moral here is, is that we should be careful with our dealings. Because the next sentence is, is that, 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 that when we are dealing with people who are dishonest, we should be careful in our dealings because eventually it's going to fall apart, right? It's going to fall apart. And so, so like Amos and like Timothy, we have to remember that they, we have to behave uh, with some integrity in our lives, right? And so, so, so I think that the, the commentators uh, spoke about this wise steward, and they talk a lot about money, and they talk a lot about uh, they talk a lot about uh, you know what this may have meant in its historical context, and then you and I from a hermeneutic perspective, what might it mean for us? But I was thinking about this notion of, of uh, one of the important teachings uh, for Catholics and our, our social teaching is Christ's preferential option for the poor. Christ prefers the poor. That's what that means. And so sometimes I think we think of that only in one domain. But, but, but there are more than that. I, I, uh, we grew up um, uh, in a little steel mill town outside of Philadelphia, and we were we were uh, uh, we were um, um, we were a scrappy kind of Irish Catholic. Our whole block there were probably about 80 kids. We were baby boomers, and and um, and the O'Toole's were down the street. And anyway, we just had a wonderful uh, kind of growing up experience. But as we grew, and we, we my, my as you know, our parents always want us to do better. So my my sister and her new husband moved to King of Prussia, which was a little more upscale than we grew up. And we were looking at family pictures at a party once. And one of her new friends said, God, you guys were really poor. <laughs> we didn't, we didn't, I guess we looked like, uh, I, you know, I was, uh, very, we were all very thin, I had a big Adam's apple. I don't know if we looked malnourished or, or that kind of <laughs> holes in our, but I thought about it, I thought, we didn't know that we were poor, right? And so that person looking at us from a particular dimension thought that we were poor, and maybe we were materially. But we certainly were not in terms of uh, the context of growing up in a very kind of loving and safe environment. And I thought, I thought about that. I thought, who are the poor amongst us? Um, on Facebook, there was a, a, a little uh, quote that I really liked. It said, uh, some people are so poor that they only have money. And I thought, wow, isn't that an interesting paradox, right? So, so, so when I was growing up, there was a, 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 an older gentleman in our town who was African-American. And he would, uh, he would push an Acme cart all through town all day long. We didn't know much about him, and we called him, we called him <coughs> Sam. And I guess the story was is that in World War I, he had experienced mustard gas, and it had left him somewhat debilitated. So all day long, and we would see him, all day long he would push this Acme cart. It didn't have anything in it. He would just push it, and he would never speak to us. 
So at moments, he became a little bit of an object of ridicule for us. But I remember that when he died, uh, uh, on the main street of our town was the uh, William A. Moore funeral home, and he was buried from there. And there were lines of people uh, uh, going into his wake. And I thought about that. I thought about what, who and what this man must have been and that we didn't know. And that somehow, in the poverty that resulted from the horrors of war, he made as much meaning of his life as he possibly could. And I think about that. When I was a friar in formation, we would have to beg our bread. And I don't know, all of us have had the experience of begging for something. Whether that's begging for someone's forgiveness. Whether that's begging God to get us out of this particular difficulty. Whether that's begging to, to, to be uh, restored in, in, in some way. We all have had the experience. There is something about us being in that position that helps us understand our essential poverty. That, that we heard last week in the Gospel, how Jesus actually chooses the weak to make them strong. You and I, every time we begin our liturgy, we make the sign that tells us something of the shape of our, our life and the sign of the cross. It is a criterion of embarrassment. What, what group of people would hail a God who died so ignominiously on the cross that we sign ourselves every time we begin with something like that? This idea of our poverty, this idea of understanding that and recognizing it in the other is probably what brings us all together in tremendous ways. And so when we hear these readings today, it really is pay attention to what and who we love. Because we cannot serve two things, you know that. If we have a mind divided, then we, we, we are not fully attentive. We cannot be intelligent then if we're not attentive. And if we're not, and if we're not attentive, we can't be reasonable or responsible. So this message for us today might be an invitation for us to reflect on who it is and what it is that we love. Because whatever that is, it will decide everything for us. We're told in the first commandment that I am the Lord your God and you shall have no other gods before me. And so whatever we put before God becomes our God. And that's what Jesus is warning here. Not so much material things, not, their, not, not having them or not having them, but what is our attitude towards them? What is our attitude towards the persons who don't have them? Right? What is it when we walk down the street and someone's asking, I, sometimes I go down to Newark and, and there's a person at the red light on exit uh, 15 there with a sign saying I'm homeless, right? And, and, I, and I look at them and I think to myself right away, rather than maybe to reach in my pocket, I think, are you really homeless? Go get a job, right? You look like, and I think, boy, I don't know the circumstances of that person's life. At Montclair, I was finishing dinner, and I was walking, and there's a young man who sits on Church Street with a sign that says, I'm an Iraqi war veteran, and I'm hungry. That's all it says. And, uh, and, and as I was leaving, I had some of my meal left, and I asked him if he wanted it, and he accepted it very, very graciously. And so there's, there's moments in our life when the poor are most visible to us. But what about those individuals whose poverty is more about their spirit, or whose poverty is more about the connections in the world, or whose poverty is really more about pain and, and, and hurt? On, on, uh, on Saturday, yesterday morning, I sat with a, with a woman who, who shared with me very tearfully that her only brother, who she was very close to, is in jail for the next 30 years for an unhealthy love of money, for an unhealthy love of money and her pain and her inability to understand that behavior. And she began blaming herself because she thought, I should have noticed the signs of uh, what was happening. How can she know that, right? How can she know that her brother had developed a, a style of life that was so dishonest that he couldn't even begin to engage the truth at any level? And that's what happens to us, I think. Whatever we love, whatever we move towards begins to define our life. And then it speaks to us about our ability to be honest and have some measure of integrity in the world. And so that's the readings for this for this Sunday, is to be careful. To be careful about what shapes our life. To be careful about how that, that with which we love defines our actions and our attentions. And Jesus so earnestly, much like Moses does in Deuteronomy, when he says, today I place before you uh, uh, a life and death, please choose life. That's what Jesus is saying today. Please be careful. Please choose what gives you life. In the end, by the way, this is all dross, right? We don't take any of this with us. Not a dime, right? Not a dime. All we take with us, right, is, is, is the experience of how we loved and how we allowed ourselves to be loved in the world. And that's what a gift that is for us. What a gift that is for us. 
And so it's not that we need to eschew money or that we need to be critical of those who have um, uh, worked hard and made some things. What we really do need to do is be careful about what our attitude is and what defines us and how we move in that direction. Because it's really true. Love, whatever we love, whoever we love, it decides everything for us. So let's continue in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us stand and profess our love for this God as we say, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. Through God all things were made, for us and for our salvation. Came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified and conscious Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit. The Lord of the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy God and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the release of sin. We look to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We offer our prayers to this God uh, who has uh, called us into life by his love. That the efforts of diplomats to eliminate chemical weapons from Syria be successful, and that the spirit open minds and hearts to find ways to end the fighting and create a just peace for all. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our Jewish brothers and sisters as they celebrate Sukkot, that they would remain faithful to the covenant God made with them through Abraham and Moses. We pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who trample upon the needy and destroy the poor of the land, that their eyes and hearts be open, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For kings, governors, presidents, and premiers, for all in authority, that they would govern with justice, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For the Bishop of Rome, that his example and his voice continue to challenge those in authority, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For healing for the sick, especially those with cancer and chronic illness, and for patients for their caregivers, are there any sick we should especially remember? Raymond Gordon, Pat Silkowski, for Lynn and Mert. We pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Those who have died, especially all victims gunned down in Nairobi, those killed after church in Pakistan, the God who is able to raise from the dead will grant them fullness of life. And are there any who should especially remember? Our veterans overseas at this time by the great country of God in battle. Dick Steiger. Lord, hear our prayer. If you would join me uh, in praying for uh, uh, the gift of life of my younger sister, who will uh, be a certain age, I'm not supposed to say. But if you uh, uh, join me in praying for her, uh, for Eileen, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. On Thursdays, uh, our parish uh, says uh, um, Mass, we celebrate Mass uh, at Arden Court um, uh, Alzheimer's Care. And so the, the folks who participate there, their, their 
ministerial responsibility is to pray for all of those who have no one to pray for them. And so uh, being aware of the poor today, we too uh, pray for all of those who have no one to pray for them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord. We pray for the American National Catholic Church that we might continue to be a, uh, a witness of God's incarnate love in the world, and especially for Sacred Heart of Jesus American National Catholic Church, which will celebrate its inaugural Mass on October 6th. So we pray that God will continue to, uh, to, uh, to lead us in ways in which we can witness to God's love in the world in, in, in very real ways. And for this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Most high, glorious God, we bring you our prayers and petitions, those which we've spoken aloud, and those in the depths of our heart. We ask you to hear and answer them if they be for our good, for we make them in the name of Christ, your Son. Amen. 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 <coughs> As our gifts are gathered and prepared, let us join with one another in number 558. Whatsoever you do, that's number 558.
pray the Eucharistic prayer, Jesus, the compassion of God. The Lord be with you. And also Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is truly right to give you thanks. It is fitting that we offer you praise, Father of mercy, faithful God. You sent Jesus Christ, your Son, among us as Redeemer and Lord. He was moved with compassion for the poor and the powerless, for the sick and the sinner. He made himself neighbor to the oppressed. By his words and actions, he proclaimed to the world that you care for us as a parent cares for his children. And so with all the angels and saints, we sing, joy, we sing the joyful hymn of your praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord. With these and all the dead whose faith only you can know, 
Lead them to the fullness of the resurrection and gladden them with the light of your face. When our pilgrimage on earth is complete, welcome us into your heavenly and home, where we shall dwell with you forever, there with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with the apostles and the martyrs, St. Matthew, and all the saints. We shall praise you and give you glory through Jesus Christ, your Son. <clears throat> Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever.
for communion is number 710, I have loved you. That's number 710.
Let us pray. Lord, help us with your kindness. Make us strong through the Eucharist. May we put into action the saving mystery we celebrate. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. If you'd be seated for just a moment, I don't want you all to stand. Uh, but there's just a couple announcements. I want to first of all thank each and every one of you uh, for uh, last week's wonderful celebration. It was remarkable. Uh, all of you who helped out, uh, coordinated Judy, uh, Ed, the liturgy, Jeff, it was absolutely beautiful. We're going to do uh, uh, not quite the same thing, but next week is our homecoming mass. And I want all of you to please come, because many times you hear about couples who I've married or children who I've baptized, and you get to see them next week. Uh, some come in from a, a, a far distance to be with us. And so we're going to have a, a homecoming mass, right? And so we think of St. Francis as your spiritual home. So please come and join us. Uh, I think it'll be a wonderful celebration. I think we're going to have, I think, uh, what I understand, half and Vincenzo and Michael are going to do some terrific cooking for us. So uh, so, uh, so that might be really nice. And uh, if you want to bring a dessert, please do that. That would be really nice. It's here. It's here. Uh, uh, there's only 23 people who signed up, so I think that we'll probably do it in the chapel since it feels a little bit more intimate. Does that make sense? And so uh, if we get too crowded, then we'll... Uh, We'll just, uh, but this time uh, we'll move around. There's some of the only two up here, so it can fit more people in there, right? So, uh, so we'll do that. Um, October 6th is the Sunday closest to the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi. As you know, this parish is conducted by the Franciscan Community of Mercy, and so we always welcome all of God's creatures on that day uh, to the parish. So bring your animals, bring your pets, bring them to Mass. We're going to bless them. Uh, after Mass, we'll have a uh, a table outside with some treats, and then we'll have a little collection for one of the shelters for the for the for our animals, so so that we can kind of donate to that, right? So so please come, bring your bring your animals. Heidi always brings a uh, a gorgeous uh, bird for us, right? And so uh, the the most exotic animal I've blessed so far has been a horse. So so uh, I, I hope they don't bring that into church. Otherwise, uh, it's a little something. But please please come uh, and bring them to mass. Uh, it's a wonderful celebration for us. Uh, so that will be on Sunday, October 6th. Uh, next Saturday, can Yeah, next Saturday we're going to be participating in the uh, Bloomfield Fest, uh, which is on a Saturday to get the word out about both St. Francis and the American National Catholic Church. So anyone that's interested in helping us um, at the table and can give an hour of time on Saturday, please um, stay after Mass today because we're just going to put together a little schedule. We have handouts and we have a wheel and we put three people over and just tell them a little bit about what we're about. Excellent. And I'll be there uh, from, um, uh, throughout the day, most of the day. It'll be fun. Actually, I'm looking forward to it. So thank you. Um, so put that on your calendar and join us if you can. You can just stop by. It'd be really nice. It'd be really wonderful. Um, it's, it's on Broad Street. It's on Broad Street. It's on Broad Street. It's good. It's good. Um, um, Thanks be to God, uh, one of the parishioners has volunteered uh, to be our treasurer. So, if, Vincenzo, would you stand up and, and in the back? And, uh, and, uh, and uh, please pray for Vincenzo since I've been managing the checkbook. Uh, I think it'll be all clear. I think it'll be all clear. So, uh, we, 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 uh, Heidi uh, has been part of our education career. She's done a wonderful job. Uh, her partner Scott. This is the blessing of the, of the blessing and the downside of growing. Uh, her partner Scott is going to be attending Sacred Heart American National Catholic Church, and so we've lost him from our educational um, develop. Uh, our education. Uh, we lost him as a teacher. So, uh, so we need people to please help Heidi. I know Allison has agreed. Allison is a teacher. If you have any time, please. Heidi's done a wonderful uh, curriculum that educates our children in the, uh, in the essentials of the faith, uh, especially around sacramental preparation. So if you have any time to help Heidi, Heidi Sandwich, of course, and Heidi's wonderful to work with. So, so uh, thank you. Uh, Heidi, do you want to say anything? Um, I actually have reg registration forms for any parents that want to register their children for religious education. I know we've got um, Avery and Dylan will be making their first communion this this year, and I teach the first communion class. So really, I need um, 
I need one or more volunteers to help with the children um, of the other ages. And we do make it easy on everybody, the parents, the kids, and the volunteers. Um, we do teach during mass. Um, so it's no more of a time commitment than you would normally be giving to church. Thank you. I don't have to be a teacher. You don't have to be a teacher. And um, we try to make it fun for everybody. I think that's the important thing. Nobody's getting hit over the head with dogma. Which is wonderful. I, I am often privileged to hear the first confessions of the children who are being prepared for Holy Communion. And I can tell you from my engagement in them around what this all means, they have a wonderful orientation. So, so they're not frightened or scared. Isn't that wonderful? That we have this God who loves us, that we don't have to be afraid to encounter him in the sacraments. Isn't that great? Thanks, witness so, father. I went to Catholic school. So, <laughs> we don't have to so we don't know what not to do, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So please, we have a lot of uh, 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 a lot of things on Wednesdays. We're meeting here. We had a wonderful time last Wednesday. Uh, on one Wednesday night, um, the friars uh, celebrate what's known as the Transitus. So on the Wednesday closest to the feast of Saint Francis, we'll be celebrating the Transitus. We gather with each other and we tell each other the story of Francis' transition from this world to the next. And then we eat almond cookies because one of Francis's great benefactors was a lady Jacoba. And she would make uh, almond cookies. It was his favorite. I think it was the only thing he ever indulged in. So we tell the story of Francis's um, uh, transition from this life to the next. And then we have some almond cookies. So join us on Wednesday night for that. But every Wednesday we're going to be gathering here for Taze prayer, uh, for mass. Uh, we'll do a, uh, a Bible study. I think Father Joe is. Uh, 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 we're going to kind of look at doing some of that. So, so uh, it's a small gathering, it's very intimate, but please join us. It's, uh, it's really very prayerful. It's a nice oasis in the middle of our week, right? So, so, uh, so if you can, I'd love for you to be part of that. Did I forget anything? No? Uh, I, I, uh, Lou sent me a, a little note today that more people are uh, volunteering for the lectures. Thank you so much. Really, this is your parish. So, uh, so please, uh, please come and be part of this wonderful experience of God's love in the world. Uh, 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 we make a joyful noise unto the Lord every time we're here, right? So, so please come and be part of this, right? St. Clarice is doing well. We had mass there on Saturday. Uh, well, it looks like we may have a guitarist for there, so that'll be good. Any musicians who wanna, who wanna, you know, a little venue? It's really good. Uh, so, uh, uh, the last thing: any newcomers today? Anybody here for the first time? Tell us who you are. Oh, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Harvey Malloy. I'm a culinary chef. I work for, I work for USDA. I'm a consumer safety inspector. I want to make sure that the product is being made at our food plants gets to you wholesome. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm um, up here in just a few weeks, and I'm very proud to be here. And uh, I have a background in the military, which I've had before. And, uh, Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> That's not an invitation to complain. <laughs> Someone else is here. I saw. Um, I'm uh, Loretta Marchese, and this is my daughter Sally. And um, I live here in Glenridge. I'm a mother. I'm a harpist. I teach harp lessons. Ooh. And I play. And um, I have another daughter who's three. She's sleeping right now. She's not with my husband. Go, but they'll be here another time. Sure. And maybe the heart. Yeah. We have some visitors uh, from very far away. If you would tell us, uh, I'm a Jewish Louise. I'm actually Chinese uh, cousin. Uh, my, yeah, I'm from Santa Clara, California, and uh, my mom Elisa and my sister uh, Cherry Fire. They're visiting the U.S. for the first time and. Uh, they went to tour in New York and New Jersey, and she was very nice to <laughs> Just so you know, our mass is international. It's viewed by Gigi's mother in uh, Dubai and by Gigi's family in the Philippines. Just so you know. Just so you know. In the back, I think we have some Hi, I'm Alice Wright. Um, my husband, Joe Burrell. Um, we live in Verona. And we're both teachers. Um, yeah, nice so to meet you. So get them on the way out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. <laughs>
is uh, Malele and, uh, and Jean. And would you stand just for a moment? I don't see them often, but I married them on a boat in New York. And I did the, I did the ceremony in Spanish, Hebrew, and English. And so, uh, so these, uh, these, the, these two have become such uh, dear, uh, dear friends of mine. And they come over from New York about once or twice a year. It's just lovely to see you both. So, so welcome, welcome. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Mass ascended. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let's all go forth joining together and singing number 599, Let Be the Lord. That's number 599. <laughs> Yeah. 